Hello, uh, my name is Marek and uh, in the next 20 minutes or so uh, I will show you uh, the main ideas behind our tool Symbiotic and hopefully I will also show you how you can use it. Um, nowadays um, the main method that uh, we use to find bugs in software is to use testing. But you sure know that uh, writing tests by hand is tedious work and uh, um, usually doesn't work as well uh, that well, so we would like to generate the test automatically. Uh, in the first talk today, we saw that we can use, for example, fuzzing to generate tests. But uh, one other method that uh, you have probably already seen and that I would like to show you now or uh, recap now is to use symbolic execution. Uh, symbolic execution is, uh, in principle, quite a simple method where you, instead of the inputs, of the concrete inputs, you say you use symbols. Symbols that represent arbitrary value uh, that the variable or the input variable can, can have. And uh, with these symbols, you just execute the program. And as the program runs, the instructions <laughs> the numbers generate some expressions over these input symbols. And uh, the interesting part comes when you run into branching in the program, where uh, uh, if you would have numbers, uh, then uh, you would know which, uh, which branch you, you should take. But when you have the symbols that represent a set of, set of uh, numbers, then it is possible that, that you can go both ways. And if it's, if it's really possible, then in this case you need to fork the execution and follow both paths. Uh, this way you can uh, explore all, all paths in the program, uh, of course if there is finitely many of them and uh, generate test cases for, for any, any, any path in the program. Um, better to show on an example, there is some, some function that takes three inputs. The, the function really does nothing, it's just to demonstrate uh, the, the symbolic execution. And at the end, it, it checks where the, the sum of the inputs is uh, less or equal to, to zero. And um, so the symbolic execution, it will uh, assign uh, symbols to the, to the variables, to the input variables, let's say alpha, beta, and gamma, and starts the execution. And um, right at the first instruction, which is the if statement, then A is alpha, so it tries to uh, find out whether alpha can be less or zero or greater than zero, which is the one branch that it can go and this is the other branch that it can go. And, um, since alpha is, is representing <coughs> arbitrary values, then it is possible to go both ways in the simple execution of branch. So, and this way it proceeds, it proceeds uh, farther and farther. And uh, for example, here it, uh, and, and, uh, it, it collects the, the constraints uh, that, that it uh, uh, finds on the, on the branchings. So for example here, uh, we try to execute this, this, this statement where A is alpha, B is beta, and C is, is 2, because it was assigned to here. And, uh, so it try, tries to check where alpha plus beta plus 2 is less or equal to 0, given that alpha is greater or, or greater than 0, and beta is greater or equal to 0. And it find, finds out that there is only one way it can go, because uh, one, of the, one of the branches is, is infeasible in this case. And uh, this way we can, um, we can try to explore every path in the program and if there is fine too many of them and we have enough resources, enough time, we uh, actually succeed. And you have to ask what about integer overflows? Um, the overflow in the variable is undefined but the overflow on unsigned int is possible. Okay, um, it depends on the, on, the, on the theory that you use to, to decide these constraints. Yeah, the point uh, is that if we use the function and it has unsigned int numbers, so then, basically, they can overflow. Yes. Well, if the if the if the theory that you use to decide these constraints um, is uh, usually you use the bit vector theory, which means that you really model the the, the numbers as bit vectors. You like model numbers as natural numbers in mathematics. Sorry. So you model numbers as as. No, no, no. We model numbers as bit vectors. It's really the the fixed size bit bit vectors that you find in computers. In this case, you, you find the overflows. If you model them as natural numbers, then you do not find the overflows. Yeah. And of course, then you can get infinite paths 
what we can do if they pass in, even with the with the bit vectors. You can find overflows uh, this way. Um, it just depends how where you, you want to find them. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, and this way we can basically partition the the, the, the inputs into sets where each each uh, each uh, input from, from from the given set will drive the program a particular uh, path in the in the in the well execute the particular path in the program. Um, one of the tools that we can use to uh, to perform similar execution uh, is is called CLI, which is open source uh, open source tool that runs over eleven bit code. And uh, since it runs over the the eleven bit code, then we first need to take sources, compile them into LLVM, and then we can put them to CLI. So here comes the first just a short demo. I have. Uh, here the function from the slides, and um, the error function is, is defined as, as uh, assertion. And uh, what I need to do to use CLI is to annotate uh, the program uh, to say which variables are symbolic. Uh, I do that with this CLI make symbolic function, and then I can compile it and run it. So I can use Clank to compile it into LLVM. Maybe get some warnings. Then I can run CLI on this uh, on, on the generated bit code. Okay, and it will show me that it found three paths uh, in in the program uh, out of six uh, that that valid the assertion. Okay, and uh, this is how we can use CLI, and we actually use uh, CLI in our tool too, um, but we use it uh, after some uh, transformations of the program. Uh, where's the problem with this uh, approach? Well, first, you need to annotate the program, and second, the symbolic execution is uh, computationally very demanding. In, uh, in the program, uh, you can have many paths, a uh, like large amount of paths, you can have infinite number of paths, and um, uh, there are some techniques how you can at least elevate this problem a bit. Uh, and uh, what we do is that we try to preprocess the code somehow uh, before passing to CLI. And uh, we try to preprocess it such that um, uh, the symbolic execution is, is uh, faster. So, uh, one of the quite obvious, obvious things that we use is to use code optimizations. That's the first step, but well, nothing surprising. Uh, the next step that we do is that we use uh, program slicing. Uh, program slicing is a technique that uh, can somehow remove from the program the, the, the parts or the instructions that, that uh, do not, uh, are not in our interest. Um, how we do that? Well, we need to compute dependencies between instructions, uh, where the instruction A depends on instruction B if uh, A generates a, a consumes some values that B generates, or where, where, when A, uh, or where, when B controls the execution of, of the instruction A. And once, once we uh, compute the, the dependencies between instructions, we uh, can slice the program, which means basically that uh, we uh, keep only the instructions that can somehow influence uh, the values at their error location and the reachability of the error location. And um, yes, uh, just a small small example. Uh, this is some other short code where when we have some some cycle that that uh, zeroes the, the buffer, and if you are interested only in this assertion that checks that there is no out of bound uh, error, then we can remove completely the buffer and. Um, when we have the dependencies in the code computed, we can do it automatically. And uh, okay, we removed uh, basically one, two instructions, but uh, the main point is that, uh, for example, this instruction is access to memory and it, it is in cycle, so it can have quite a uh, uh, good effect to remove this instruction. And of course, when you have a bigger program, you can remove more. Okay, so this is program slicing. 
and it works well when you have the assertions in the code and if you are interested in the assertions. But um, we try to uh, look also for, for other types of errors like uh, dangling pointer reference and this. And there is a problem that um, uh, in this case we do not know uh, the targets of, of, the sli of the slicing, uh, so-called slicing criteria. Um, because well, we, could, we could take every pointer the reference and um, um, set it as, as the slicing criteria, but then the slicing wouldn't help much because we wouldn't slice anything away. So what we do is that we run some um, uh, fast static analysis that tries to find possible errors in the program and uh, uh, that uh, just look, looks at the program, process it, and divides the instructions into, into two types. Uh, one type is the, the safe instructions that, uh, that cannot lead to, to the error that we are interested in, and the other that may possibly exhibit the error. Well, this is over approximation, so it is possible that uh, the, the instructions that, that just may exhibit the error are, are actually safe uh, during the runtime. But uh, we do not know, so uh, we take them as, as potentially unsafe, and uh, we set them as slicing criteria. And now we, we know uh, which instructions are interesting for us with respect to the error we are looking for, and um, can slice with respect to these, to these instructions. Okay, and um, yes, so, so after, after these uh, three steps, we can uh, again uh, perform code op optimizations because uh, the program slicing and uh, the first code optimizations, well, mainly the program slicing, uh, can enable some more aggressive opti optimizations of the code, and uh, the code may change again. Um, Okay, and apart from this, uh, from this transformation that I just mentioned, then, then uh, Symbiotic automatically marks the memory symbolic, so we do not need to manually annotate the program with CleanMake symbolic, and um, replaces undefined functions with some symbolic stubs. Uh, that's just because we do not want the user to, uh, to uh, somehow uh, change the program before before passing it to symbiotic. Uh, what are our limits now is that we do not support C++, uh, mainly because of exceptions, and uh, we do not run on parallel programs uh, yet. And uh, of course, it, there are problems with scaling because uh, symbolic execution, uh, uh, the program transformation transformations cannot cannot save or cannot. Um, cannot solve the problem of, of the scalability of symbolic execution. In, it can just help in, in, in some cases. Um, so, short demo. Okay. Um, just to see that uh, this is the same code as before, just uh, we uh, omitted the, the annotation we made symbolic. Um, so in this case, um, the def default mode of symbiotic is to take un uninitialized uh, variables as, uh, as symbolic. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bit problematic because uh, in this case it's actually undefined behavior, but uh, yeah, user usually wants something like this. Uh, okay, so we can run symbiotic on this program. Uh, the default mode is to look for assertion violations and uh, we get some, some, some message that it started slicing, blah, blah, blah. And it found an error here in, in, in main foo with this, uh, these values of variables. Okay, that's the same example as before. Uh, or I can show you uh, this example. There's some singly linked lists. Uh, it creates two elements in the list. It has some assertion, okay, and uh, we can try to run symbiotic on this code. Okay, and it says that uh, no error found, uh, which means that the assertion is not violated. Uh, that was the default mode of symbiotic that looks for assertions, but if you want to look for uh, memory safety errors, we need to tell it to symbiotic. 
So we decided to look for property uh, mem safety. In which case, when we run it, it uh, finds that there is a uh, memory leak in the, in the program. <coughs> okay. So, and the memory leak is, uh, memory leak is uh, that we haven't uh, freed the, the middle element, so we can fill it in, try to, try to run it once more. Okay, and now it, now it uh, works. So, no error there. Um, the last example, I have here um, the code of Valent, which is a inter-process communication library. I guess you know it. And uh, just I, will find, I filled in this, this main, where there is some um, structure that represents a circular buffer. And um, okay. yes, this is this 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 structure. It has some data head tail, and uh, then we have some some function uh, real buffer put that that uh, just copies uh, copies the data into into the buffer. So, if we try to create a buffer. Uh, copy this uh, hello world string into the buffer and uh, assert that the buffer size is, is the same as, as the string, uh, we would expect that, that that's true. So we can run a symbiotic on that. <coughs> okay. Okay, and it repels an error because of compilation that it cannot uh, find the FFI uh, header file, uh, which is quite a uh, usual problem with compilation. So we can fix it, I hope. Yes. I have it somewhere. <coughs> okay, so I just hope it will work now. Okay, and we saw that it 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 works now. It uh, optimized the code, sized it in, in some time, and it found that the the assertion the assertion is violated. Well, what's the problem? The problem is that uh, that the the buffer was initialized, so the 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 model that Symbiotic found to for for this or this case that it found was that uh, the buffer was initialized to zeros. And then the variable, the probably the head variable, was some garbage, and uh, the, the the tail variable was or, or uh, again zeros. So, <coughs> okay, we can fix it. Okay, let's see where it works now. Yes, and now it works. And just to show how it would look uh, without um, without slicing and optimizations. So now it took like seven seconds. We're on it now without slicing and optimizations. Well, first we see that um, much more much more um, parts of the code needs to be needs to be somehow uh, modeled by, by by the symbiotic. And uh, yeah, and now it takes like 18 seconds. Uh, it's not that big difference, but on bigger programs, it can it can be uh, more significant. Okay. So um, so that's that's uh, basically how how we can use symbiotic. So in the future, we would like to somehow uh, solve the issues with scalability, which uh, in some cases. Uh, there can be also problem in slicing, so we would like to employ faster analysis to, to slice the, the code faster. Um, there is the inherent problem of symbolic execution, but it can be somehow somehow uh, fought by, for example, abs abstraction, or different. Uh, <coughs> or we could instead of symbolic execution uh, use uh, some different tool, uh, something 
I know something like so Clang static analyzer, which actually cannot be used uh, for for this purpose, but something like that, which is um, less precise, so it can give some uh, errors that are not real, but uh, it is faster, and can and, and is able to to run on on bigger programs. Uh, then we would like to uh, uh, model the the mainly the POSIX environment uh, better. I mean, it works somehow now, but uh, it's not perfect, and of course we would like to fill in C++ and threads, because when once symbiotic uh, supports C++, then we can run symbiotic on symbiotic, because symbiotic is run on in, uh, is written in C++. Mm -hmm. And um, to conclude, just symbiotic uh, is a tool for finding or faster finding bugs uh, in C programs. Uh, and it does it by combining static analysis with uh, program slicing and symbolic execution. Um, unfortunately, now it runs only on uh, sequential C code uh, and um, has, still has some scalability issues. Um, that, that is all for me, and uh, thank you for your attention. Of course, I'll be happy to answer questions. <clears throat> what do you do when the condition is like calling a library function and you don't really want to add the whole library to the analysis, right? Can you somehow define what's possible there? Yes. <coughs> uh, good question. I actually saw that here, I think. Yes. Um, so, this calls. It's yes. all the same. It's like a black box, but there's some. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. if you don't anyhow limit like output of this thing, right? Then everything is possible, basically. Yes. And you can find some phantom bugs which don't mm -hmm. really exist. And if you like look at the function, it's written that it can return like zero or minus one only, for example, like something like that. But it cannot return like in max, for example. Yes, um, you can do that, uh, and uh, it is quite easy to integrate. In, it can be integrated into Symbiotic quite easily because it just uh, you can just add a model in, in the C programming language uh, or in the LLM bit code that somehow tells how the function behaves. So instead of the whole function, you would just write short stuff that inserts some, like assume that if, this, if the input is such and such, then the output is going to be such and such and assume that this cannot happen, and so on. So by adding this, 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 uh, this uh, model of function and adding it, adding it into, into uh, appropriate di directory, Symbiotic, Symbiotic would uh, look it up and try to link it to the program once it finds it is in the program. So you can do that. Uh, at present, we do not do that. We uh, do, as you said, we assume that anything is possible. Another question is, can you actually scale horizontally by adding more servers? Like, can you do it like on Amazon with spot instances, run one hundred servers, and then we will analyze the whole unit kernel? Uh, in principle, yes, because we can, uh, during the slicing, we can generate different slices that uh, represent different parts of the program, and then you can, re re uh, then you can distribute the work among, among uh, computers. But we don't do that. But yes, in principle, yes. Okay. So the algorithm allows that? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm out of time, so thank you for your attention.